guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to our part two of the next presidential series installment as we're taking a look at the 18th vice president of the United States, Henry Wilson. I hope you guys enjoyed part one. Of course, uh, I am flying solo this week, so uh, it'll just be me for the uh, the audio here uh, as well for part two. So uh, let's just jump right in. Uh, you know, I pretty much, you know, I think uh, we, we have everything uh, in place to just jump right in. Part one, of course, we looked at the early life, birthplace, uh, you know, early legacy, that sort of thing. So now let's just jump right in here with part two. Wilson and the Radicals. Henry Wilson soon stood among the inner circle of radical Republicans in Congress besides Charles Sumner, Benjamin Wade, Thaddeus Stevens, and Henry Winter Davis. He introduced bills that freed slaves in the District of Columbia, permitted African Americans to join the Union Army, and provided equal pay to black and white soldiers. Wilson pressed President Lincoln to issue an Emancipation Proclamation and worried that the final product left many people still enslaved in the border states. Known as one of the most persistent news hunters in Washington, Wilson brought knowledgeable newspaper reporters straight from the battlefield to the White House to brief the president. Despite his intimacy with Lincoln, Wilson considered him too moderate and underestimated his abilities. The senator was once overheard denouncing Lincoln while sitting in the White House waiting room. He hoped that Lincoln would withdraw from the Republican ticket in 1864 in favor of a more radical presidential candidate. Following Lincoln's assassination, Wilson initially hoped that the new president, his former Senate colleague Andrew Johnson, would pursue the radical Republican agenda for reconstruction of the South. He was deeply disappointed in Johnson's endorsement of a speedy return of the Confederate States to the Union without any protection for the newly freed slaves. When the 39th Congress convened in December of 1865, Wilson introduced the first civil rights initiative of the post-war Congress. His bill aimed at outlawing the black codes and other forms of racial discrimination in the former Confederacy, but deemed too extreme by the non-radical Republicans, it was defeated. Wilson also proposed that the Constitution be amended to prohibit any effort to limit the right to vote by race. Johnson's more lenient policies for Reconstruction and his veto of the Freedmen's Bureau Bill and other congressional efforts to protect black Southerners eventually drove moderate Republicans into an alliance with the radicals. Over time, Wilson saw his objectives, objectives added to the Constitution as the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. He supported the use of federal troops to enforce congressional reconstruction, to permit freedmen to vote, and to establish Republican governments in the southern states. When Johnson stubbornly resisted the radical programs, Wilson endorsed efforts to impeach the president. He accused the president of unworthy, if not criminal, motives in resisting the will of the people on Reconstruction and cast his vote to remove Johnson from office. However, seven moderate Republican senators broke ranks with their party and the radicals failed by a single vote to achieve the two-thirds necessary to remove the president. National Ambitions Prior to the presidential election of 1868, Henry Wilson made an extended speaking tour throughout the southern states. Many journalists interpreted this effort as a means of promoting himself as a presidential candidate. In fact, Wilson supported U.S. Grant, the hero of Appomattox, 
for president and sought the vice presidential nomination for himself. Always a political mechanic bent on building coalitions, Wilson felt certain that the Southern Republican Party could survive only if it became biracial. I do not want to see a white man's party, party nor a black man's party, he told a black audience in New Orleans. I warn you tonight, as I do the black men of this country everywhere, to remember this, that while a black man is as good as a white man, a white man is as good as a black man. See to it while you are striving to lift yourselves up that you do not strive to pull anybody else down. By urging Southern blacks to take a conciliatory, nonviolent approach toward those who had so recently enslaved and oppressed them, Wilson stunned his radical Republican colleagues in Congress. Wilson is a blank fool, wrote Ohio Senator Ben Wade. Nevertheless, Southern delegates to the Republican convention generally supported Wilson's candidacy. On the first ballot for vice president at the Chicago convention, Ben Wade led with Wilson not far behind. That ballot marked Wilson's peak, and he lost support steadily on subsequent ballots. When House Speaker Schuyler Colfax gained strength, Wilson's delegates switched to Colfax, giving him the nomination. Grant's election brought expectations that Wilson might be named to the cabinet, but the senator asked that his name be removed from consideration, citing his wife's critically ill health. She died in 1870. Still, Henry Wilson remained an influential and frequently consulted senator throughout Grant's first term. So as you can see, the reality is that Wilson never really had presidential aspirations. Uh, but in 1868, he did want to become the vice presidential uh, nominee. Uh, obviously, that didn't work out, and Schuyler Colfax was uh, chosen. But, of course, Schuyler Colfax was a lame duck vice president. He only served under uh, Grant during Grant's first term. So, of course, Grant did serve two terms. So when Grant was reelected, uh, guess who was now up to bat, so to speak? It was his turn uh, to become vice president. Yes, Henry Wilson. So we're going to get into that now um, about Grant's second vice president. Now, we are going to also, in a few minutes, be looking at some election maps and that sort of thing, like I always like to do uh, regarding the election that got whoever we're speaking about uh, elected and nominated and such. So uh, we will be going over that here in a second as well. Grant's second vice president. By Grant's inauguration in 1869, Massachusetts boasted the most powerful delegation in Congress. Wilson chaired the Senate Military Affairs Committee, while Sumner chaired Foreign Relations. In the House, four Massachusetts representatives chaired committees, including Appropriations and Foreign Affairs. Commenting on the state's two senators, Massachusetts Representative George F. Hoyer, or Hoare, noted that while Sumner was a man of great learning, great principle, and great ego, Wilson supplied almost everything that Sumner lacked. Wilson was the more practical politician, with his finger on the public pulse. He recognized the value of party organization and did not disdain the art and diplomacies of a partisan. Wilson also combined practical politics with a strong inclination for reform. He spoke out for civil rights for the freedmen, voting rights for women, federal aid to education, federal regulation of business, protection of women, and prohibition of liquor. Hoyer judged that no other man in the Senate not even Sumner had more influence over his colleagues than did Henry Wilson. During Grant's first term, 
the imperious Sumner challenged the new president and defeated his plans for incorporating Santo Domingo into the United States. President Grant retaliated by goading the Senate Republican Caucus to remove Sumner as chair of the Foreign Relations Committee. Wilson spoke in defense of retaining Sumner's chairmanship. A wounded Sumner opposed Grant's renomination in 1872, raising concerns that he and his allies might bolt to the liberal Republican Democratic fusion ticket headed by the eccentric newspaper editor Horace Greeley. After Vice President Schuyler Colfax released word that he did not intend to stand for a second term, many Republican leaders calculated that selecting Wilson for vice president would outflank Sumner and strengthen Grant with workers and with the old anti-slavery guard. Saluting the working class origins of their ticket, Republican posters showed idealized versions of Grant, the Galena Tanner, and Wilson, the Natick Shoemaker, attired in workers' aprons. Just as the presidential campaign got underway in September of 1872, the New York Sun published news of the Credit Mobiere scandal, offering evidence that key members of Congress had accepted railroad stock at little or no cost, presumably to guarantee their support for legislation that would finance construction of a transcontinental line. On the list were the names of Grant's retiring vice president, Colfax, and his new running mate, Henry Wilson. Newspaper correspondent Henry Van Ness Boynton sent the New York Times a dispatch reporting that Senator Wilson had made a full and absolute denial that he had ever owned Credit Mobiere stock. In truth, Wilson had purchased the stock in his wife's name, but had later returned it. Called to testify before a House investing committee, Boynton recounted how he had gone to see Wilson to ask if he would deny the charges against him and that Wilson had given him an absolute denial, knowing that he would file the story that night. Wilson did not contradict the reporter. General Boynton is a man of character and truth, he told the committee, and I should take his word. Although the committee cleared Wilson of any wrongdoing in taking the stock, it concluded that the information Wilson had given the Times had been calculated to convey to the public an erroneous impression. The Ravages of Ill Health The Credit Mobier scandal did not dissuade voters from re-electing Grant and making Henry Wilson vice president. Wilson helped the ticket by embarking on an ambitious speaking tour that took him some 10,000 miles to deliver 96 addresses, ruining his health in the process. In May of 1873, the 61-year-old Wilson suffered a stroke that caused him to lose control of his facial muscles and to speak thickly whenever fatigued. Although doctors ordered him to rest, the advice went against his nature. A friend wrote, you know he was never still for five minutes and it is more difficult for him than for most persons to sit quietly and dream away the time. After spending the summer recuperating in Massachusetts, Wilson traveled to Washington in December for the opening of the new Congress, but by January, his poor health forced him to return home once again. Instead of presiding over the Senate, he spent his time writing a multi-volume history of the rise and fall of the slave power, memorializing his own role in the great events of the Civil War and Reconstruction. Henry Wilson's ill health kept him from playing any role of consequence as vice president, but did not suppress his political concerns and ambitions. He lamented that a counter-revolution was overtaking Reconstruction and urged his old anti-slavery veterans to speak out against efforts 
to limit the rights of the freed men. Wilson blamed the decay of Reconstruction on the Grant administration. According to Representative James Garfield, the vice president had asserted that Grant is now more unpopular than Andrew Johnson was in his darkest days, that Grant's appointments had been getting worse and worse, that he is still struggling for a third term, in short, that he is the millstone around the neck of our party that would sink it out of sight. Yet Wilson could not bring himself to admit that his own involvement in the Credit Mobier scandal, as well as the involvement of other members of Congress in the many other scandals of the era, had dimmed the moral fervor of the anti-slavery movement and congressional reconstruction, thus undermining public confidence in an active federal government. For the rest of the 19th century, political trends moved away from Wilson's cherished reforms. A new generation of genteel reformers advocated limited government, civil service reform, and other administrative solutions and abandoned support for the voting and civil rights of the freed men, women's rights, and other social reforms that Wilson esteemed. In the spring of 1875, Vice President Henry Wilson made a six-week tour of the South, raising suspicions that he intended to advertise himself for the presidential nomination the next year. He returned home optimistic about the chances that the Republicans could build political and economic ties to conservative Southerners by appointing a Southern ex-Whig to the cabinet and by offering economic aid to Southern businesses. Policies later adopted by the next president, Rutherford B. Hayes. Although Grant desired a third term, Wilson's friends felt sure that the vice president could win the presidential nomination and election. Wilson's great ambition went unfulfilled. That fall, he consulted Dr. William Hammond, complaining of pain in the back of his head and inability to sleep. I enjoined rest from mental labor, the doctor noted, but the vice president replied that he could not comply with those wishes as fully as desirable. Dr. Hammond saw Wilson again in early November and noted, vertigo, thickness of speech, twitching of the facial muscles, irregularity of respiration, and the action of the heart, slight difficulty of swallowing, and intense pain in the back of the head and nape of the neck. Sounds lovely. He observed that the vice president's hands were in almost constant motion, and he could not sit longer than a few seconds without rising and pacing the floor or changing to another chair. Wilson insisted that he must travel to Washington for the new Congress, but promised his doc doctor not to work too hard. He told a friend that he would at least be able to preside at the opening of the Senate and perhaps through most of the session. During the 19th century, many members of con Congress lived in boarding houses and hotels where the plumbing left much to be desired. To accommodate them, the Capitol provided luxurious bathing rooms in its basement for the House and Senate. There, members could soak in a large marble tubs enjoy a massage, and have their hair cut and beards trimmed. On November 10th of 1875, Henry Wilson went down to soak in the tubs. Soon after leaving the bath, he was struck by paralysis and carried to a bed in his vice presidential office just off the Senate floor. Within a few days, he felt strong enough to receive visitors and seemed to be gaining strength. When he awoke in his Capitol office on November 22nd, he was informed that Senator Oris Ferry of Connecticut had died. Wilson lamented the passing of his generation, commenting, that makes 83 dead with whom I have sat in the Senate. Shortly thereafter, he rolled over and quietly died at age 63. His body lay in state in the rotunda, and his funeral was conducted in the Senate chamber, 
the vice presidential chair arrayed in black crepe. In his memory, the Senate in 1885 placed a marble bust of Wilson by the sculptor Daniel Chester French in the room where the vice president died. There, the Senate also installed a bronze plaque with an inscription written by his old friend and colleague, George F. Hoare. Or Hoyer. The inscription read, In this room, Henry Wilson, Vice President of the United States and a Senator for 18 years, died November 22nd of 1875. The son of a farm laborer, never at school more than 12 months, in youth, a journeyman shoemaker. He raised himself to the high places of fame, honor, and power, and by unwearied study made himself an authority in the history of his country and of liberty and an eloquent public speaker to whom Senate and people eagerly listened. He dealt with and controlled vast public expenditure during a great civil war, yet lived and died poor, and left to his grateful countrymen the memory of of an honorable public service and a good name far better than riches. And there you have it. The life and legacy of Henry Wilson, our 18th vice president of the United States. You know what I find uh, pretty interesting that I actually didn't realize until I was researching Wilson. He died on November 22nd, uh, the same exact day, November 22nd of 1963, of course, that John F. Kennedy, another very famous Massachusetts politician, uh, also, you know, died. He was assassinated, of course, Kennedy. But interesting, two men uh, from Massachusetts both died on the same day. Uh, Kennedy, very tragically, at a very young age. And, you know, Wilson, he wasn't assassinated, of course, but, he, you know, he's pretty young. Even for the time, uh, 63 was pretty young. Uh, and he died pretty pretty unexpectedly. So, um, so there you go, uh, Henry Wilson. Now, let me read you a few things that I wanted to just kind of touch on uh, so I have everything here. Um, all right, here we go. So, Henry Wilson's political career, uh, we know all about it. Free Soil Party organizer. He was a U.S. Senator from 1855 to 1873, of course. Um, then about the Civil War, he was a colonel and a commander in the 22nd Massachusetts Volunteer Infant Infantry. Um, then, of course, I already spoke about this a bit in part one, but the Greenhow controversy. In July of 1861, Wilson was present for the Civil War's first major battle at Bull Run Creek in Manassas, Virginia, an event which many senators, representatives, newspaper reporters, and Washington society elite Travel from the city to observe in anticipation of a quick Union victory. Riding out in a carriage in the early morning, Wilson brought a picnic hamper of sandwiches to feed Union troops. However, the battle turned into a Confederate rout, forcing Union troops to make a panicky retreat. Caught up in the chaos, Wilson was almost captured by the Confederates while his carriage was crushed, and he had to make an embarrassing return to Washington on foot. The result of this battle had a sobering effect on many in the North, causing widespread realization that Union victory would not be won without a prolonged struggle. In seeking to place blame for the Union defeat, some in Washington spread rumors that Wilson had revealed plans for the Union invasion of Virginia to Washington society figure and Southern spy Rose O'Neill Greenhow. According to the story, although he was married, Wilson had seen a great deal of Mrs. Greenhow and may have told her about the plans of Major General Irvin McDowell, which Mrs. Greenhow then conveyed to Confederate forces under Major General P.G.T. Beauregard. One Wilson biography suggests someone else, Wilson Senate clerk Horace White, was also friendly with Mrs. Greenhow and could have leaked the invasion plan, although it is also possible that neither Wilson nor White did so. Pretty interesting stuff. Definitely uh, an interesting story. 
Then, of course, we know he was a big equal rights activist, uh, big time for uh, freedmen, for slaves that were freed after the Civil War, uh, for black rights, civil rights, uh, women's rights. Uh, he was a very, very big activist in all of that. Um, the creation of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, he was actually involved in that as well. Um, so that's pretty interesting stuff. Um, trying to see what else here. Reconstruction, of course, civil rights. I already just kind of touched on that. Of course, the 1868 uh, presidential election um, where he tried to go up for to be the vice presidential candidate, but he lost out to Skylar Colfax. And then the 1872 presidential election where he actually won the vice presidential nomination and he was on the ticket with Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, so you can see here uh, the election of 1872. I always like to do this. Um, you know, it just kind of shows maps and that sort of thing. And uh, it was it was a pretty, you know, they won fairly handedly uh, here. This wasn't really a close contest whatsoever. Um, uh, Grant and Wilson won pretty handedly. Uh, popular vote was like 55.6% to Grant and Wilson. To, uh, they went up against Horace Greeley. Uh, he only had 43.8% of the popular vote. So uh, pretty, pretty handedly they won. So there's some maps, of course, and some, you know, posters from that, of course, from the uh, campaign and from the election. Uh, so that is the election that got uh, Henry Wilson elected as vice president, the election of 1872, where uh, Ulysses S. Grant won a second term. Uh, what else here? So the Credit Mobier scandal, we, know, we learned about Wilson's involvement in that. Uh, then, of course, his vice presidency was from 1873 to 1875. Wilson served as vice president from March 4th of 1873 until his death. As vice president, Wilson's years of Senate experience enabled him to perform as a highly efficient and acceptable presiding officer. During his term, he cast one tie-breaking vote in favor of passing the Civil Rights Act of 1875. After his death... The office of vice president remained vacant since there was no constitutional provision to fill an intraterm vice presidential vacancy until the 25th Amendment in 1967. This meant that the Senate president pro tempore, Thomas Ferry, was now next in the line of presidential succession. Ferry remained next in succession until March 4th of 1877. Uh, Wilson's ceremonial duties and work on history of the rise and fall of the slave power in America kept him extremely busy, working late hours with little time to rest. In early May of 1873, Wilson attended funeral services for Salmon P. Chase in New York City. On May 19th of 1873, he suffered a stroke which caught, caused paralysis in his face general weakness and impaired speech. His doctor ordered him to rest, but Wilson allowed reporters to see him. The public first took notice that Wilson was in ill health when he made an appearance in Boston on May 30th, and reporters were informed that Wilson was unable to work or handle his correspondence. His health somewhat improved during September and October, and on November 25th, 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 Wilson returned to Washington for the opening of Congress. He was able to preside over the Senate from December 1st through December 5th of 1873, but he was unable to speak in public, including when he attended a Boston commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. Wilson remained in occasional ill health until 1874, but was able to attend funeral services for Charles Sumner in, in March. And throughout his remaining tenure, Wilson's Senate attendance was irregular due to his continued poor health. During periods when he was not ill, Wilson was also able to resume some of his ceremonial duties, including participating in a White House party for the King of Hawaii, David 
Kalakwai. Kalakwai? Kalakwai? In December of 1874, when Free Soil and abolitionist colleague Jared Smith died in New York City on December 28th of 1874, Wilson traveled there to view the body and take part in funeral services. Wilson c- continued to go through bouts of ill health in 1875 while working at the United States Capitol on November 10th of 1875. He suffered what was believed to be a minor stroke and was taken to the vice president's room to recuperate. Over the next several days, his ill health appeared to improve and his friends thought that he was nearly recovered. However, on November 22nd at 7.20 a.m., Wilson suffered suffered a fatal stroke while working at the Capitol. His remains were accorded the honor of lying in state at the United States Capitol Rotunda. The subsequent funeral arrangements included military escorts as Wilson's remains were transferred from one train station to another en route from Washington to Natick, as well as knights laying in state. The route included processions in Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York City, and Boston, and knights laying in state at Baltimore City Hall in Independence Hall in Philadelphia. He was interred at Old Dell Park Cemetery in Natick, Massachusetts. Two other former vice presidents died in the same year as Wilson, John C. Breckinridge and Andrew Johnson. Wilson was only the fourth vice president to die in office, following George Clinton, who served under both Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, Elbridge Gerry, who also served under Madison, and William Rufus King under Franklin Pierce. A little bit about his historical reputation. According to historian George H. Haynes, during his near, nearly 30 years of public service, Henry Wilson practiced principled politics by championing, championing, championing uh, unpopular causes sometimes at the expense of his personal ambition. The causes Wilson supported included abolition of slavery and the rights of workers both black and white. Wilson was not hesitant to sever ties with old guard politicians and form new coalitions in order to accomplish his objectives, even though this gave him the reputation among opponents of being a shifty politician. On the other hand, he was admired by fellow abolitionists for his lifelong dedication to the cause, and workmen found inspiration in his career since he had found himself risen from a manual laborer's background. Wilson supported free public schools and libraries. In Massachusetts, he supported tax exemptions for the purchase and maintenance of workers' tools and furniture and the removal of property qualifications for voting rights. U.S. Senator George F. Hoyer, a Massachusetts political contemporary, said Wilson was a skillful, adroit, and practiced and constant political manager and the most skilled political organizer in the countries in the country during his career. Wilson is also recognized for being a political pioneer in techniques for determining public opinion while he held office. In the 20th century, The straw poll and scientific public opinion polls by companies, including Gallup, became standard parts of political campaigns and media coverage of elections. During his Senate career, Wilson pioneered straw polling by sampling the views of Massachusetts voters through in-person conversations and unscientific written surveys before making his own views known. These efforts were credited with helping Wilson build coalitions, win elections, make political allies, and determine the best time to act in the Senate on issues of importance. In 1891, the Henry Wilson School, a facility for black students, opened on what was then Central Street in the Washington County portion of the District of Columbia, which is now 17th Street in the Adams Morgan neighborhood. It was named for him in honor of his role emancipating the district slaves. The school was closed in 1956 due to its small size and shortly thereafter converted to the Morgan Annex, 
a satellite location of the adjacent Thomas P. Morgan School. The Morgan Annex was later closed. It was sold in 1989 and then reopened as the Morgan Annex Lofts Condominiums. Personal life on October 28th of 1840, Henry Wilson married Harriet Malvina Howe. They were the parents of a son, Henry Hamilton Wilson, who attended the Highland Military Academy in Worcester, Massachusetts. During the Civil War, the younger Wilson attended the United States Naval Academy, but left before graduating in order to accept a commission in the Union Army. Um, just kind of goes on here. In 1869, Henry and Harriet Wilson also became the de facto adoptive parents of a girl, Evangelina, or Evangeline, who was born between 1864 and 1866 and took the name Eva Wilson. In a complicated series of events, in 1869, a woman named Caroline Vreeland met Nancy Colbeth, wife of Wilson's brother, Samuel. Vreeland allowed Nancy Colbeth to adopt the child with the understanding that she would be raised by Henry Wilson and his wife. The child lived with the Wilsons until shortly before Mrs. Wilson's death. Nancy Colbeth then kept the child and received monthly payments from Henry Wilson for her support. Details later emerged which indicated the likelihood that Vreeland had obtained a baby girl from an unknown parent or parents in Boston in 1866 so that her sister could use the baby to extort a man with whom she had an affair. Vreeland went to prison for a stabbing in the early 1870s. The child continued to live with Wilson, and by 1874, he had asked Nancy Colbeth to again be responsible for her. Wilson agreed to provide them a suitable home and financial support, but had not followed through by the time of his death. Wilson requested that the executor of his will, nephew William Leander Coolidge, used most of Wilson's estate to ensure that Wilson's mother-in-law was cared for and that Eva receive an education and financial, financial support. Wilson had given Coolidge verbal instructions and letters, and the situation became, became complicated because Wilson's death occurred before he had incorporated these additional instructions into his will. Coolidge act, acted as a trustee for Eva, and by 1889, when she was more than 21 years old, she claimed she was entitled to the remainder of Wilson's estate. Other Wilson family members disagreed because of the complexity of the details. Coolidge petitioned the Massachusetts courts for guidance. The courts found in favor of Eva, by then married and known as Eva Carpenter, and she received most of the estate, which was valued at approximately $10,000, which is about $239,000 in today's money. Interesting stuff about uh, his daughter, or, you know, Eva Wilson. I didn't even know about that. Um, and I'm very curious. I want to look more into her, uh, try to kind of dive deeper into Eva Carpenter Wilson. But uh, a couple things I wanted to touch on. Um Something that you guys probably, I'm sure you definitely saw in part one, uh, Wilson's birthplace in Farmington, New Hampshire. There is a roadside sign uh, that I'm showing you, I'm sure, right now on the screen. Uh, and there's also a big boulder there in Farmington. It's actually right near and right next to the um, country club. I believe it's the Farmington Com Country Club golf course. Uh, so it's right there. So that is the general area where, you know, he was born, where his farm was. Uh, I do find it really interesting that uh, there's no mention of his real name on either the boulder uh, or the sign. Um, I, I just find that interesting. It just says Henry Wilson, which, yes, that is very true. Uh, his name is Henry Wilson. He legally changed it. But when he was actually born there... Uh, he was born... Oh, no, it does. I apologize. I take that back. See, I stuck my foot in my mouth. I take that back. I was looking at the Boulder photo when I was saying this. Uh, the sign does actually say it. Uh, born in Farmington, February 16th of 1812, Jeremiah Jones Colbeth. Uh, so there you go. So pretty cool. So the sign is there. 
I didn't get there uh, up to Farmington, uh, New Hampshire, uh, but here's the sign. These are stock photos. These are not my photos uh, that you're seeing uh, on your screen. I did not take those of his birthplace sign and boulder there in Farmington, New Hampshire. Another thing I wanted to quickly touch on was the Natick Cobbler, his workshop, his shoe shack. Uh, the 10-footer workshop of Henry Wilson, the Natick Cobbler. Uh, the tiny red wooden workshop at the corner of Mill Street and West Central Street is a 10-footer, and it's part of Natick's history. It was used before the Civil War by Henry Wilson, a Natick shoemaker who served as vice president of the United States. He was born in Farmington, New Hampshire, into a financially troubled family. His name at birth was Jeremiah Jones Colbeth. Um, in 1833, he was released from his apprenticeship, and blah, blah, blah. Wilson's workshop, so that's his workshop, this little red building you're seeing pictures of, is now on the National Register of Historic Places, is an authentic example of shoemaker shops once found in towns across Massachusetts when the state was becoming the nation's largest shoe producer. When Henry Wilson arrived in Natick, shoemaking was a cottage industry with much work being done in small workshops, 10-footers, roughly 10 feet square. After the mid-19th century, production was done in factories. Uh, so pretty interesting stuff. Wilson's specialty was a simple, inexpensive leather shoe known as a brogan. Strictly speaking, Wilson was a cordwainer, which is a highly trained artisan who can make shoes using new leather and not a cobbler who could only repair shoes. Most of his customers were located in the American South, where many enslaved people on pla plantations wore them. Though Wilson's customers were mainly Southern slaveholders, he was among America's most vocal abolitionists. One of his friends told a story that revealed an instant in which Wilson's disdain for slavery outweighed his financial interests. One of Wilson's Southern customers was seven to eight hundred dollars in arrears, equivalent to owing twenty-three to twenty-six thousand dollars today. To reassure Wilson that payment was forthcoming, the customer sent a record of his assets. When Wilson realized that his customer intended to settle the debt by selling enslaved people, he refused the payment. In the 1850s, his interest shifted to the military and politics, in particular the nation's growing anti-slavery movement. He joined the Natick Militia, and rose to Brigadier General, proudly claiming the title of General Wilson through the rest of his political career. Uh, Wilson served as Grant's Vice President. Uh, we know all that. Um, so there you go. So that is the 10-footer, the Natick Cobbler, his little shoe shack there in Natick, Massachusetts. Uh, and the last thing I want to read is just some overall facts i found this little like facts random facts about vice president wilson thing henry wilson was actually born into poverty as jeremiah jones colbeth even when trying to be respectful the kindest words that could be used to describe his father were shiftless and intemperate mr colbeth gave his son the name of a wealthy neighbor who had never married we already know all that uh, since the plan to inherit a neighbor's money by naming his son after him didn't work, Wilson's father apprenticed him to a cobbler. Uh, we know that. Um, Wilson was supposed to be given rudimentary education during his bound apprenticeship, but received virtually no schooling. Uh, at the beginning of his political career, Wilson was a member of the Whig Party. Uh, like George Washington... Henry Wilson had to borrow money to get to his inauguration. Members of Congress had recently been granted a 50% raise, so Wilson, a senator at the time, received $5,000 shortly before being elected vice president. However, Wilson had been loosely and innocently, it seems, connected to the Credit Mobier scandal, which had caused problems for quite a few congressmen, and was probably the reason that Wilson's vice presidential predecessor, Schuyler Colfax, decided to retire and leave a spot open on the ticket when Grant sought re-election in 1872. To be extra careful, Wilson gave his $5,000 raise directly back to the U.S. Treasury. 
After the 1872 election, Wilson, now the vice president-elect, told his close friend Senator Charles Sumner, I have not got enough money to be inaugurated on and borrowed $100. Pretty cool. Vice President Wilson and his fellow radical Republicans were worried that President Grant was positioning himself, himself for a third term. We know that, and dragging the Republican Party down. He was, many Republicans saw Wilson as a potential presidential candidate in 1876 who could bring the need of reforms and would have the courage to push a progressive agenda. Uh, but his health was declining. Um, Henry Wilson was the first vice president to be honored by laying in state in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol building. Henry Wilson was the great-great-uncle or great-grand-uncle of 1988 Democratic vice presidential nominee and longtime Texas Senator Lloyd Benson. Didn't know that. Pretty cool. So there you go. And then last, uh, but certainly not least, his gravesite. Henry Wilson is buried at the Dell Park Cemetery there in Natick, Massachusetts, uh, seeing a couple pictures here of my visit there uh, to the gravesite. And of course, like I said, kind of holds a special place in my heart uh, just due to the fact that it was used in the newspaper article locally uh, by the newspaper here in New Jersey when they did an article about me in 2020. Uh, so, yeah, so pretty cool stuff. Uh, so there you go, Henry Wilson's gravesite. Uh, one thing I've always noted about his gravesite, it is like, it's got like mold and moss growing on it. I mean, it looks completely unkept and like nobody really has cared for it for many, many, many years. Uh, pretty sad, actually. So, uh, but there's his gravesite there at the Dell Park Cemetery in Natick, Massachusetts. And that, thus that concludes, as they say, our look at at the 18th Vice President of the United States, Henry Wilson. Hope you enjoyed this, guys. The life, the legacy, the death and the gravesite of Henry Wilson. And uh, stay tuned. There is a little bit of bonus footage. So stay tuned for that. Um, not too much, uh, but there's a little. And of course, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be off for the next two weeks as far as our Vice Presidential Series goes. But... Uh, stay tuned next week for a very, very special Dead History Christmas video. Really looking forward to that. So stay tuned for that. And uh, we will see you next week for that video. Uh, be well, stay safe, and happy holidays out there to everyone. Thank you for everything that you guys do. Keep it coming. Thank you so much for the support. Can't thank you guys enough. Don't forget, go check out KurtzHistoricSites.com. That great website of Kurt Dion, uh, go check it out. It's really awesome. So thanks, guys. See you next week. Guess who's back? Back again. TJ's back. Tell a friend. <laughs> anyway, beside my absurd, horrible rapping, uh, I forgot to mention a couple things that I wanted to touch on before I show you bonus footage. Uh, first and foremost, since it's fresh on my mind, uh, I want to show you this clip, which actually happens to be one of my favorite clips in, like, political history, literally. Uh, this is from the 1988 vice presidential debate, um, and it was the Democratic Party vice presidential candidate Lloyd Benson who we learned is a distant relative of Henry Wilson's, and he was going up against the Republican Party vice presidential candidate, Dan Quayle. Uh, and it is one of my most favorite quotes and favorite moments ever. Uh, so take a look here. It's a short little, like, one-minute clip. You'll get a kick out of this. Get a, get a load of what uh, Lloyd Benson says to Dan Quayle. Take a look. I have far more experience than many others that sought the office of vice president of this country. I have as much experience in the Congress as Jack Kennedy did when he sought the presidency. I will be prepared to deal with the people in the Bush administration if that unfortunate event 
would ever occur. Senator Benson. Senator, I served with Jack Kennedy. I knew Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy was a friend of mine. Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy. That was really uncalled for, Senator. <laughs> you're the one that was making the comparison, Senator. And I'm one who knew him well. And frankly, I think you're so far apart in the objectives you choose for your country that I did not think the comparison was well taken. Oh, that is good stuff, isn't it? <laughs> Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy. Uh, pr pretty funny stuff. Uh, so that's first and foremost. Uh, secondly, not sure if you guys noticed. However, when I was showing the Natick shop, the little 10-footer, that red building that is uh, in Natick, Massachusetts, that is Henry Wilson's shoe shack, uh, those pictures were courtesy, of course, of... Kurt Dion from KurtzHistoricSites.com. I put that up on the screen, of course, so you could see that. Um, did you notice that in those pictures as they were going by on the screen, that the sign at the actual shoe shack there says Henry Wilson, 20th Vice President of the United States. He's not the 20th Vice President. He's the 18th Vice President of the United States. Absolutely unbelievable. Now, little uh, side note, a little uh, asterisk here. Kurt Dion took those photos in 2012. So we have to take that with a grain of salt. I have not been back there uh, since. I have not seen the shack. So there's an outside chance that that error and that mistake has been corrected over the last eight or nine years. Uh, but I am not 100% sure. So if it has been corrected since, then that's awesome. But back in 2012, when those photos were taken, that sign most definitely said, you're probably seeing it on your screen now, 20th Vice President of the United States. Unbelievable. Big boo-boo. That is not true. He's the 18th Vice President of the United States. So uh, pretty cool stuff. Okay, so we got uh, what I wanted to show. Now, one more thing. Uh, well, it's actually two more things. But remember that I, when I was talking about Henry Wilson's personal life, I had touched on the fact that he had a daughter. It wasn't actually his daughter. It was like an adopted daughter, uh, Evangelina or Evangeline, uh, better known as Eva Wilson. And it said something to the effect of a woman named Caroline Vreeland met Nancy Colbeth who was the wife of Wilson's brother, Samuel. Okay, well, here's where it gets a little strange. I can find information that says there was an Eva Wilson. I don't know what happened to her. Uh, supposedly, you know, from what we read, she got married to somebody uh, with the last name Carpenter. She became Eva Carpenter. Um, I can't find anything on her. I can't find exactly when she might have died. Uh, and also what's strange is I can't find anything that says Henry Wilson had a brother named Samuel. Um, that is what's really odd. I looked in family trees and I can find nothing. And I even looked like on his parents' side because obviously his father was uh, Winthrop Colbeth Jr. and Abigail Colbeth was his mom. I looked to see if maybe his mother had a child from like a previous relationship or maybe his father did. Nothing. Nothing at all. Um, so it's a little odd because I can only find that Henry Wilson has two siblings and that neither of them are named Samuel. Uh, his two siblings actually were John Francis Colbeth and George Albert Colbeth. Um, so I have no idea. I even looked on his wife's side on Harriet Malvina Howe. I looked on her side to maybe see if it was like Wilson's brother-in-law. Maybe it was Harriet's brother. Nothing. Uh, so I have no idea where this came from. And I don't know how accurate it is. I think Eva Wilson is definitely true. I think Eva Wilson existed. But as far as 
Wilson having, uh, you know, uh, there's nothing. I can't find anything. I literally cannot find anything. So, sorry, I cannot uh, vouch or say that that story is 100% accurate because I cannot find any information on it. So if anyone has any information on that, please uh, write in the comments. Leave us some uh, notes and some facts. Would love to hear about it because I cannot find anything about it. Also, last quick thing. I forgot to mention this in part one or part two. Uh, the fact that Henry Wilson was challenged to a duel twice. Yeah, twice while he was in uh, the Senate. Uh, on May 22nd of 1856, Preston Brooks brutally assaulted Senator Charles Sumner on the Senate floor, leaving Sumner bloody and unconscious. Brooks had been upset over Sumner's Crimes Against Kansas speech that denounced the Kansas-Nebraska Act. After the beating, Sumner received medical treatment at the Capitol, following which Wilson and Nathaniel P. Banks, the Speaker of the House, aided Sumner to travel by carriage to his lodgings where he received further medical attention. Henry Wilson called the beating by Preston Brooks brutal, murderous, and cowardly. Preston Brooks immediately challenged Wilson to a duel. Wilson declined, saying that he could not legally or by personal conviction participate. In reference to a rumor that Preston Brooks might attack Wilson in the Senate as he had attacked Sumner, Wilson told the press, I have sought no controversy and I seek none, but I shall go where duty requires, uninfluenced by threats of any kind. The rumors proved unfounded and Wilson continued his Senate duties without incident. Um, pretty interesting. The attack on Sumner took place just one day after pro-slavery Missourians killed one person in the burning and sacking of Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, the attack on Sumner and the sacking of Lawrence were later viewed as two of the incidents which symbolized the breakdown of reasoned dis discourse. Um, so that was one incident. The second incident was in June of 1858. Wilson made a Senate speech in which he suggested corruption in the government of California and inferred complicity on the part of Senator William N. M. Gwynn, a pro-slavery Democrat who had served as a member of Congress from Mississippi before moving to California. Gwynn was backed by a powerful Southern coalition of pro-slavery Democrats called the Shivs, or the Chives, I think it's Shivs, who had a monopoly on federal patronage in California. Gwynn accused Wilson of demagoguery, and Wilson responded by saying he would rather be thought a demagogue than a thief. Gwynn, uh, that is, of course, William M. Gwynn, then challenged Henry Wilson to a duel. Wilson declined in the same terms he used to decline a duel with Preston Brooks. In fact, neither Gwynn nor Wilson wanted to follow through, and commentary about the dispute broke down along partisan lines. One pro-Gwynn editorial called the insinuation that Gwynn was corrupt a most malignant falsehood, while a pro-Wilson editorial called his reluctance to take part in a duel evidence that he was honest and conscientious and had more respect for the laws of this country than his adversary. After several attempts to find a face-saving compromise, Gwynn and Wilson agreed to refer their dispute to three senators who would serve as mediators, William H. Seward, John G. Crediton, and Jefferson Davis were chosen and produced an acceptable solution. At their instigation, Wilson stated to the Senate that he had not meant to impugn Gwynn's honor, and Gwynn replied by saying that he had not meant to question Wilson's motives. In addition, the mediators, mediators caused to be removed from the Senate record both Gwynn's remarks about demagoguery and Wilson's suggestion that Gwynn was a thief. Pretty cool stuff. I love those stories about, like, being challenged to a duel. Forgot to mention that, and I had to do it. So there you go, guys. 
thank you. Sorry I cut in again. And now, here you go. Enjoy this bonus footage. Bye-bye. Hey guys, TJ here with Dead History, and uh, I just wanted to quickly uh, just do a little audio here for the bonus footage. Uh, so just so everyone knows, I did intend on driving up from New Jersey to Natick, Massachusetts uh, to actually revisit Henry Wilson's grave and to actually see Henry Wilson's shoe shack. Uh, but just so everyone knows, one way... Uh, it's a little over four hours of a trip. So you figure all told round trip, probably roughly about nine hours, boring any major, major traffic. Uh, and unfortunately, um, I just don't have the time to do that. Uh, you know, we're only a week before Christmas, as everyone knows. Um, I, I just don't really have the time to, to drive up there and do it. So uh, the bonus footage is just going to be my photos uh, at the Henry Wilson grave site there in Natick, Massachusetts. Uh, another thing is I did look up some other online photos of the Henry Wilson uh, shoe shack. And it looks like, yeah, even recent photos. I know I told you that Kurt's photos, the ones I used, were from 2012. But I found articles and even recent photos from 2020, 2021 that still say 20th Vice President of the United States. So the sign is from what I can tell, still wrong. Uh, pretty amazing. So uh, these photos you're going to see here are my uh, visit to the Henry Wilson gravesite. It's at the Dell Park Cemetery in Natick, Massachusetts. And Henry Wilson, our 18th <laughs> vice president of the United States, is buried there, along with his wife, Harriet uh, Malvina Howe Wilson, um, his uh, parents, Winthrop and Abigail Colbeth are both there. Um, uh, his uh, son, Henry Hamilton Wilson, is buried there. Uh, and even one of his brothers, uh, George Albert Colbeth, is buried there in Natick. So pretty much the whole Wilson clan is uh, buried right there at the Dell Park Cemetery in Natick, Massachusetts. Enjoy the pictures. Smaller cemetery, <clears throat> kind of off the side of the road. Uh, you know, like I said, pretty, doesn't seem like, uh, the, uh, the gravestones of Henry Wilson and his family are really very well kept. Uh, you'll see that from the photos, but, uh, it holds a special place in my heart, not only because he's one of my favorites, uh, just because my photo was used, like I said, for the, uh, news article and all. So thanks guys. Enjoy the bonus footage. Sorry, I couldn't get up there to make more, but. Merry Christmas to everyone out there. See you next week for our very special Christmas video. Bye-bye.